As we approach Christmas and the holidays, Christians experience the season of Advent as a time of expectant waiting and preparation. Welcome to a special series of Advent conversations entitled, What Are We Waiting For? Over the four weeks of Advent, we've enjoyed listening to conversations between four of Canada's national church leaders. This evening's gathering is the fourth and final Zoom event and is entitled, The Cost of Discipleship. Tonight, the Reverend Dr. Robert Ferris, moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Canada, will interview Archbishop Linda Nichols, primate of the Anglican Church of Canada. And now, without further ado, here is Reverend Bob Ferris. It's wonderful to be able to gather again virtually from many different places. I'm joining the call today from the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat, Peytoun, Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit Indigenous Peoples. We live and work and worship, learn and meet on lands that are the traditional territory of many different Indigenous peoples who were here before the establishment of European colonies. We acknowledge the land's significance for the Indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities are tied to the land. We acknowledge the treaties that were made regarding many of the lands we live on, treaties which still exist. As churches, we acknowledge our role in colonization, that as churches, we have been involved in colonial practices and structures that profoundly harmed generations of indigenous people, families, and communities. We affirm our calling and commitment to truth, healing, and reconciliation with Indigenous people and ask for God's guidance as we seek intentional actions to end anti-Indigenous racism and uphold the dignity and rights of Indigenous peoples. As we have done in the last couple of weeks, I'd invite us to just have a moment of silence while we reflect upon that acknowledgement and its meaning for our lives. Let us pray. God of promise, you have given us a sign of your love through the gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who was promised from ages past. We believe, as Joseph did, the message of your presence, whispered by an angel, and we offer all of our prayers for your world, confident of your care and mercy for all creation. Amen. Amen. So it's great to be with Archbishop Linda Nichols tonight, uh, a colleague and a friend, and uh, to begin to address this question or this theme of the cost of discipleship. I mentioned in our conversation together that I had read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book with that title uh, early on in my theological education, and that it's had it had really a profound effect on me and as it's had on many others, I think, as we ponder what it means to be uh, Christians in the modern world and in a world where we're often confronted by uh, uh, authoritarianism, uh, by violence, by marginalization of different peoples, in a whole host of ways in which the inhumanity uh, of, of our, our, our lives together is demonstrated. And, and how it is that we are, as Christians, are to be disciples of Jesus Christ, of the one whose birth uh, we, we await and we celebrate in this time of Advent and Christmas. One of the, uh, the, the uh, ways in which the churches have been called 
to a costly discipleship, it seems to me, in the last number of years and even decades, probably, is around the the situation in Israel, Palestine. And uh, a few years ago, we had uh, something called the Kairos Palestine document, which called Christians around the world to come and see the situation in which they were living and uh, for us to be in solidarity with them. And uh, I know that uh, both Archbishop uh, Linda and also uh, National Bishop Susan Johnson of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, who's been a part of these conversations as well, as well have recently returned from a trip to Israel-Palestine. So, Linda, I'm wondering if you could start by telling us just a little bit about that trip and and where something of the cost of discipleship might be seen in that experience. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, yes, I just returned last Friday evening from about uh, eight or nine days in the Holy Land, the land of what we are often reminded are the living stones of Christian faith and community. And it was a, a trip in which uh, Bishop Susan and I were witnessing to our full communion relationship with our partners in the Middle East, uh, mm -hmm. Bishop Azar in Jerusalem and Archbishop Hosam Naum in Jerusalem and meeting with various Lutheran and Anglican bodies that are serving the Palestinian community there. And for me, I've been on pilgrimage to the Holy Land before, but this was my first visit uh, right into Gaza and into parts of the West Bank. And seeing the challenge for Palestinian people in the current environment, and particularly with the great fears around what the newest government of Israel might um, bring about because of the partnership with a, some very very right-wing people in that country. And what I was most struck by was the cost of discipleship for Palestinian Christians who are such a small minority of the people of that land. And, and yet they've been there since the time of Christ. And they've been witnessing to faith since the time of Christ. And there's a, a huge costliness to staying under the conditions in which they find themselves and of being faithful in service. Uh, we talk about loving our neighbor and I saw all of these ministries of hospitals and schools and vocational training that are there simply to serve whoever is in need. Uh, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, whoever, um, primarily Muslim and Christian, of course, in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, but under uh, condition, living conditions of restriction and hardship that mm -hmm. I think we would find very hard to accept. And the fact that it uh, is exacerbated by, by being such a small minority uh, certainly was um, salutary for my own faith. To say, yes. you know, I, I've lived in Canada, which, you know, for my lifetime has been a at least nominally Judeo-Christian country in which I'm in the majority and mm -hmm. I'm privileged and I'm white. And, mm -hmm. and so I've not had to live with the kind of discrimination and hardships. And um, so to, to, to speak to the Christians there who have a gentle beauty about their faith and about their witness uh, is a reminder that the cost of faith is higher than we sometimes remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember I was in uh, Israel-Palestine about uh, 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago now, uh, with um, a group that went with the uh, Rick Horst, who was the moderator of the Presbyterian Church at that time. and. Uh, just we we were able to travel on highways that Palestinians weren't able to travel on, but we had some sense of the time it took just to travel between different areas with the the checks and the the ways in which people's travels were slowed down. Um, so it was just hard to plan even for everyday life to go from 
to go to a doctor or go to a school or go go to the fields uh everything was uh uh somewhat slowed down and patience was always required uh no matter uh, what situation you were in we certainly um, heard stories of of people who needed to come out for instance come out of gaza in order to receive cancer treatments but their permits were not always granted so mm -hmm. just imagine having cancer knowing that you needed to travel to east jerusalem or somewhere for either radiation or a particular kind of chemotherapy that has to be done on a certain schedule but you could never guarantee that you would have a permit to be able to do that mm -hmm. um, I, I think we would we just find that a, a very very hard to understand and um you know i'm i'm deeply aware of the need for security and safety for uh for israel um and i wish i could see a better solution on the horizon uh, mm -hmm. certainly challenges ahead mm -hmm. but i i i did certainly um sense the cost for those who are living there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's one of the places where our four denominations, uh, those that have been gathered around these conversations in Advent, have uh, worked together or have collaborated. I'm thinking especially of the World Council of Churches program, the Ecumenical Accompaniment program in Palestine and Israel. And um, it's one way in which Canadian Christians maybe come a little closer to to the reality that Palestinian Christians face day by day and other Palestinians as well, of course, uh, as they accompany them at, at uh, security checks and in different ways. I wonder if you met any uh, any of those folks. Sorry, I, this, I didn't ask you this before, whether you may have had any uh, connection with the EAPPI program or? No, I, I haven't, but I certainly know mm -hmm. people who have and I'm aware of that program. and. Um, Certainly, in in the Anglican Church of Canada, we we have a, a, a group called Companions of the Diocese of Jerusalem, and we encourage people when they're visiting the Holy Land to not only visit the biblical sites, but to visit the community, the Christian community that is there today, the living stones mm -hmm. that continue to be there, and to have a sense of of what it is to witness as a Christian in that land today. Uh, mm -hmm. so that it's um, it's certainly a part of our, our understanding of what's needed to be partners and brothers and sisters in Christ in this time. Mm -hmm. there, there are people, perhaps some who are gathered with us tonight, but and others certainly in all of our denominations who would raise pretty strong and serious questions about why why we would get involved in this, that it's a uh, a very political thing that it's something that's gone on for centuries if not millennia that there's no real resolution to it so why why would we as canadian christians uh get involved there why not do something else why not do something in our own country where we can um you know uh clean up our own act before we uh, get involved in other parts of the world, in the very complicated parts of the world, like Israel, Palestine? Well, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. I think that the call to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love mm -hmm. neighbor is not just the neighbor that's next door. Mm -hmm. It's our neighbor in humankind. And whenever we see uh, you know, the violation of human rights, when we see um, concerns about people's safety, uh, poverty, human trafficking, all of those big issues that seem intractable. And yet, if we don't speak up, then we allow them to grow and we allow them to continue to fester. And although our efforts may be small and, and may seem to not have a whole lot of effect, they are holding up a light, uh, a candle in the dark to say, this is not okay. Mm -hmm. Now, it needs to go alongside, very much alongside, uh, looking at ourselves. But sometimes we see ourselves more clearly by looking at the other. 
and I do know, for instance, that um, there's been some uh, talk about a comparison of the situation for Palestinians with the situation for indigenous peoples in Canada. And, mm -hmm. and I, I do think that uh, I remember speaking to an indigenous cleric who had visited the Holy Land and been deeply moved by the similarities of experience uh, of being in the West Bank and Gaza or being on indigenous reserves in Canada. And that should give us some pause that we need mm -hmm. to ask questions about what are we not seeing here and yet we see there. So I, I continue to believe that it's not an either or, and it is complex and it's not easy, but that also is part of the cost of discipleship is a willingness to enter into the pain and suffering of the world in order to better understand and open our hearts to, to whatever the Holy Spirit is going to say to us, both at home and in other places. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I recognize the challenge. I recognize how hard it is. I recognize the desire to, to just stay where we know the culture and the context. Mm -hmm. uh, but my own life, I, I lived overseas for a number of years. And uh, in my own life, I know that that my, my faith life and my spiritual life have grown and my, my relationship with God has grown and deepened because of my encounters with the other. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's as much about uh, 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 changing us as mm -hmm. much as it is about changing mm -hmm. what's happening for mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. And that that's all part of changing the world. Yes. It, it might be, uh, Bishop Susan was saying in our conversation that uh, sometimes she gets a little frustrated. She might say more than that, but <laughs> <laughs> that, that the church in this part of the world looks more like a club than than a church and that as she's been working hard at uh, spiritual renewal and and of the basic disciplines of the christian life that uh are needed in our own context as well as in other parts of the world and it it kind of it it it's i think what what is um, pushes us in terms of this cost of discipleship or thinking about what's often called prophetic ministry of uh, challenging uh, uh, the the kind of situation the norms of of our own culture that that may be contrary to our understanding of the Christian gospel I I remember just just thinking what you were saying about living in other parts of the world and and the challenges that come back to us that uh, uh, when I was in South Africa uh, finding out and being told often, that uh, people from the National Party in South Africa came to Canada to study the reserve system here in order to develop the system of homelands in South Africa. Um, and it, it that really shines a light back on us and on who we are and what our history has been. And, and, and this um, kind of comfortable way of being the church, which we've talked about often in these conversations, that's that's close to power, close to government, close to uh, one of the institutions that are the pillars of the the society and the country in which we live. And yet often we're called in now, perhaps more than before, to stand in places that are somewhat at odds with that power that uh, is, is, is part and parcel of Canadian society as well. And, and where that might be calling us as churches and as church in Canada, I wonder. Yes, I, I, I think certainly for my lifetime, Christians and in the mainline churches have been in the majority, mm -hmm. or at least have been in the majority in power. And we are rapidly moving to a time when we are not the majority for many reasons, secularization, uh, immigration of other faiths, uh, not, uh, you know, which are not bad in and of themselves, except that it moves us into a new space in the public square, mm -hmm. a space of being a minority, of being a voice that is not automatically respected or uh, has no automatic right to be heard. It has to, it has to, it has to claim its own space. Mm -hmm. And um, we are not comfortable with being the minority because we don't we don't really like it. <laughs> it, 
it's um and and that i think that's where uh observing and walking with those who are deep minorities in their own lands uh will be a teaching place for us uh, mm -hmm. and we of course have to learn how our time in the majority and in power uh blinded us to the ways in which we uh, colluded with policies that were harmful. So certainly around indigenous peoples, uh, my church and your church a little bit uh, were co oh, yes. by the government uh, around <laughs> residential schools. Yes. And, and we just uh, drank the Kool-Aid and believed that being Western European white people and white civilization was the best for everybody. Um, without ever asking or listening more deeply. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we have in our baptismal covenant in my church that, that the call to respecting the dignity of every human being. Well, we didn't do that. We, mm -hmm. we made Indigenous people second class in every way. And even the education we provided was second class. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we're paying for that now deeply because we've got a long journey of reconciliation of self-determination for indigenous people that we must walk with and listen to. Mm -hmm. And so it, 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 it raises the question for me of where today are we not seeing? And I think the new areas that have emerged, uh, and well, they're not new, but I think they're emerging to the forefront uh, with greater power are the issues of racism. Um, yes. Uh, nobody wants to be labeled a racist, mm -hmm. but our churches are part of systems, both socially, culturally, and within our church systems that uh, have been rooted in the, the privilege that, that the white community has held. Mm -hmm. And we don't even see what we don't see. And so we need others to um, raise their voice and challenge us. And discipleship is going to ask us into, into a deep humility, a deep humility about where is the voice of Christ speaking to us through these voices of challenge? And are we prepared to listen and repent? and turn around and change mm -hmm. and uh, accept that ours is not the only the best or the brightest way to live in this world. Mm -hmm. There are gifts to be received from others. Uh, and so the discipleship ahead of us is going to be costly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think, uh, you know, it, one of the parts of the conversation that we've been having is that sometimes we're, we're like a deer in the headlight when we're confronted by these things and we don't know what to do. We know that, that who we've been hasn't been right. We've, we've been in the wrong space or, or we're being called out of that space at least, but we don't know how to speak. And sometimes we're just afraid to speak. Uh, perhaps our guilt keeps us silent sometimes, but but often um, we're afraid to speak in situations where where we also need to speak and act in solidarity with others. Um, I know again, just thinking of the uh, Bonhoeffer's cost of discipleship, the critique of the German Church, and it's. Uh, reluctance or even refusal to speak uh, as as things became worse and worse and worse, and then was co-opted into the whole system uh, that grew with Nazism and fascism. Um, and, and sometimes we're, we're silent, and, and there are those who from outside the church, I think, and, and some from inside as well, who say that, and maybe to us as church leaders often, you don't you don't speak enough you don't say the word that's needed because you're 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 trying to be careful uh and 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 nuanced and and thorough in understanding what the situation is but 
but there come times when you must speak and act and, and say something. Um, I, and I know that's a challenge for me uh, in my earlier days um, uh, when I was in Mozambique, I, I had a very loud voice uh, in terms of solidarity and what the church should be doing. It becomes different when 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 we're in places of authority within the church as well. Yes, when you when you become a national church leader and you are there to both lead and represent the voice of the whole church. You are deeply aware of the variety of voices in the church mm. and wanting to hold those voices uh, in community together. And that can be extremely difficult when you're dealing with, with a subject uh, of justice uh, yes. that needs prophetic leadership because leaders are also called to prophetic voice but of course, the definition of you know which which side of an issue is the prophetic voice mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and it requires um, discernment, and there's no simple black or white answer. And the cost of discipleship that I think the four of us would all acknowledge mm -hmm. as leaders is the cost of having to go deeply within oneself to listen to the Holy Spirit, listen to the whole church, discern a path or a voice that needs to be spoken, and then speak it knowing that whatever is said will uh, generate response. Some of it very <laughs> yes. upset, some of it yes. very laudatory, some of it, uh, some of it very confused. And at the end of the day, um, you stand, in a sense, extremely vulnerable and naked before God and say, God, this is what I can say in this moment. This is what I believe the, the Spirit is calling us to. And so I lay this out. But um, it, it can be a very painful place to be at times. And I think all of our churches have been through that kind of very difficult discussion around human sexuality. And it's not... Mm -hmm. It's not over. I mean, there's certainly ongoing conversations about that. Um, and yeah, uh, the ordination of women. I mean, that was <laughs> yes, early yes. on, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the voices that spoke up for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in my own denomination, that's not a settled question around the world. I mean, when no. I was in Holy Land, I I would not have been permitted to celebrate the Eucharist because they do not ordain women in the Anglican Church in that diocese at this mm -hmm. time. And they are only ordaining the first Lutheran woman in a couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm aware that these things take decades mm -hmm. of discernment and experience. And our call at times is to be the voice uh, gathering up what is being discerned and and challenging the church to listen mm -hmm. there are yes. any number of issues on which that is emerging mm -hmm. yes yes well i wonder if we should um, take some questions from others who are uh with us tonight and and jim do you have some questions I, I do have a few questions and I invite others to to send more. Um, I'm going to start out with a comment, though, first, because it's always nice to hear. Uh, Jim Pott uh, says, uh, great conversations in the videos each week and the weekly panel discussions. Thanks very much. This is a great model, not just for dealing with current issues from a faith perspective. It's also a great expression of unity. So thanks. It, it was and is a gift. No question for me today. Just applause for getting us to think deeply about important concerns. So that's nice to hear. Thank so you. let's go to our first question. Um, George Ryder says, uh, he speaks specifically to uh, being that Quebec has adopted the secular approach, quote unquote, how do we as a faith community make a dent in the life of this society? And I'll leave that, I'll give that to you. Um, and uh, well, we'll start with that one. And I'll, I don't have so many that I can give them to you in packets of three quite yet. So, <laughs> okay, well, that's, that one can keep us going for a while. <laughs> I'll turn it to you, Linda, first. Okay. Well, um, 
Yes, um, Quebec society is 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 highly uh, secularized, and I do know from my colleagues in Quebec that they have had to uh, work hard at speaking strongly and together with as many uh, faith voices as they can, particularly in light of, and I've forgotten the number of the bill, but the bill that um, has uh, uh, indicated that anybody in public service cannot wear any religious symbol. And that has meant that um, women who wear the hijab cannot be public school teachers, uh, uh, six that wear the turban cannot be uh, in uh, wear it in public service, and I do know that th that there have been voices strongly raised. Um, does it make a difference? Well, it may not have changed the law, but it does it does raise voices to say that that this is not everybody in the province uh, on the same page. And it allows others who might be a little afraid to speak up, maybe to speak up, because they know that there are others who uh, who are with them. Um, when you are a minority, uh, it can be easy to just go silent. But I do think that raising the voice puts it in the public square and says, this is a voice of of people who live in this in this province, and people who care deeply about others in this province, and we want it to be heard. And it it may feel like crying in the wind, but I I still think it's essential. I think I think it's a place that points to what what we've been talking about of the change of the place of the church in society. And when you think of Canadian history and of Quebec history and the role particularly of the Roman Catholic Church in, in Quebec, um, it was perhaps most the, uh, um, a, a at least a very clear model of Christendom within Canadian society where the church and the state were very closely allied, where there was a deep, deep influence of the church in the life of people and of the society as a whole. And we know the the very rapid transformation beginning in the 1960s in Quebec that that just turned that around completely. And I, perhaps for some of us in the rest of Canada, uh, we 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 perhaps haven't recognized that the shock of that or the the immensity of that change in in Quebec, which has been happening as well in the rest of Canada and among Protestant churches and particularly historic mainline Protestant churches as well. But it's perhaps been a little more gradual or there's been more of a sense that, um, you know, the church still is around, especially this time of year, uh, the church still has a role to play and perhaps we'll go to a, a service or especially Christmas Eve or something like that. And, and as long as the church isn't really making any uh, big noises about too much, then uh, it's still there. It's still somehow apart. But but I think the situation in Quebec is is different and and it's um, it's uh, much clearer or sharper in in what's what's happened in the relationship between the institutional church and government and the rest of society and uh um it's it's not to say that that we shouldn't push back on on the law that does limit religious expression uh but it, it's helpful i think to recognize that it is in that context that that this is emerging and um and that it, it has a lesson for us in the rest of the country as well. And it says something to, I think, what, what you've been saying throughout the conversation tonight, Linda, about what it means to be this kind of dif different kind of church, a prophetic church or a church that's more on the margins, that's more uh, that isn't in the places of power. And so, um, you know, we walk in solidarity with people of other faith communities um, that are, are most deeply impacted by this. Christians perhaps have been as well, but it's, it's particularly people of other faith communities. And what does that mean for us as Christians who once held 
the power to walk in solidarity with those who find themselves marginalized and and um, having to face uh, uh, particular restrictions in their faith, their lives of faith. I think also there to be a little bit more positive about our place in society was that during COVID, um, the Canadian Council of Churches uh, had a couple of unique opportunities where where the federal government asked for a meeting with faith leaders, mm -hmm. because all of a sudden it, it, it seemed to be we were we were um, recognized as having, frankly, the the largest and widest and best network on the ground of uh, to be able to communicate with the population around issues of vaccination, around issues of uh, messages around uh, how best to respond to the COVID crisis. And um, that was kind of a revelation because I can't think of any other time when on two separate occasions, we had Zoom calls with the prime minister of Canada at the prime minister's office's request. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do think we forget that, that we still, and that was with a broad range of faith leaders. Uh, I, I think we forget that we have a voice that is more powerful than we, we might imagine and that uh, we have the ability to connect with people from coast to coast to coast, uh, elderly and young, uh, men and women and children and youth, uh, maybe not as many as we'd like, but, but, but they're still there. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. And uh, we've got buildings and spaces, public spaces in communities, uh, in the smallest of communities, as well as the largest. And, uh, you know, we have we have the resources to be able to connect with people in a, in quickly mm -hmm. in a way that the government realized that uh, that communication would be essential. So uh, I think we sometimes underestimate our own capacity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Another question, Jim. Okay. Well, we're getting a few more now, so I Good. think I can put two together here. Um, Carolyn asks, um, Benjamin Netanyahu has just entered into a liaison with other parliamentarians uh, and will be president of Israel again with the farthest right policies of, for in years. What does the bishop think of this? Is there any hope? And Kim asks, I wonder if there is an element of clinging to our privilege and dragging our feet and helping in certain situations if we create these false dichotomies of we should help in our own country before helping elsewhere as a means of keeping ourselves where we feel, still feel in power. So th those are two together. Well, certainly the first one, um, everything I heard when I was in Israel is of a deep, deep concern for the new coalition government in Israel the far-right politicians who, who've been brought into this coalition are uh, quite frightening in the policies that they want to institute. And, um, and, and I was speaking primarily with Palestinian Christians, so I can't speak for the Jewish voices in the country, although some people did allude to the fact that the Jewish community is also concerned, so parts of the Jewish community are concerned. Uh, about this coalition, um, I think we will uh, we will see very quickly, uh, you know, what will happen. Um, they've been put in pretty powerful positions within the government uh, in the in the cabinet of Netanyahu, mm -hmm. um, and it's um, it's worrying, very worrying. Um, on on the second question of does it help us feel more in power to 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 want to try to respond just within our own country, that's possible. Um, we certainly have a different relationship when we're when we're speaking into issues in another space. I mean, in fact, I could not and I would not speak directly into those issues in Israel. But but what I can do is speak to our government about concerns about how our government relates to a government that uh, that is um, violating human rights in so many ways. And that seems completely opposite the values that the Canadian government and our country have 
have upheld and certainly uphold in other country-to-country uh, -country relationships. So the voice that can be raised is a voice about how our country relates to the country um, and, and about uh, how we offer support and uh, how we offer uh, 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 grants and um, other resources for the development of stable society, both for the Palestinians and for, for Israel. And so that's where we can speak. Um, does it continue to keep us in power? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Mm -hmm. And and I th I think we're not the the change from a, a Christendom model to to a more prophetic church is is not saying that the church should not be engaged in the public square um and and that we we would lose all contact with uh government i was saying i think it was last week in the conversation or maybe the week before that many partners around the world including probably palestinian christians want us to speak to the canadian government uh it's important we have a proximity to power uh, global power uh, by just simply by being citizens of Canada and and living in North America that uh, others do not have um, and and so it's it's not a matter of uh, abdicating all power or responsibility or accountability uh, it's it's um, discerning what it is we need to speak to government and listening as you've been saying Linda uh, and and we've we've heard with Carmen as well, and certainly in our relationship with Indigenous people, the need to listen before we speak, and to hear the voices of those we walk in solidarity with uh, before we before we speak. And in our own context, that any any um, uh, connection or voice or call to government comes from the whole church and that includes indigenous christians and and racialized people who are christians and everyone who's part of our our churches it, it's all it's our voice together that speaks to government not from some particular part of the church mm -hmm. and i think what you said there about remembering that power in and of itself um, there are all kinds of power and, and how you use that power is really critical and what you use it for, mm -hmm. you know, is it for the other, is it for the uh, uh, betterment of the whole community of God's people, the whole of creation, mm -hmm. uh, or is it for self, is it to uh, make you feel better, so it, it's always examining our motives. Um, coming at it with a humility and asking, you know, basically looking at the example of Christ, what did it mean to lay aside certain kinds of power to enter into a vulnerability that then uh, actually was a power to change the world? Mm -hmm. And thinking about what, how do we use the um, voice we have? And what do we use it for? Is is are the questions we need to ask? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Car Carol has a question. As we in Canada become more of a minority, you mentioned that Christian minorities in other lands are a good example for us. Do you have any example countries areas for us to explore or follow? Well, I, I certainly was moved by the Palestinian Christians that I met. Um, you know, I also, I, I lived in India for some years where uh, Christians are very much in the minority. Um, the the, the, the um, witness of the church there is, is somewhat mixed. Um, you know, the church got kind of sucked in in some places into the, the culture of, of, um, of, well, in some cases, corruption. And um, it hasn't always been a, a straightforward witness. But I've also, 
I also think of places where where the gospel has had to be enculturated in different ways that teach us that our way of enculturating the gospel is not the only or the best. So whether uh, people are in a minority, at the very least, the witnessing to how Christian faith is expressed in another place, in another culture, in another language, in another way of being um, can have something to teach us. And that's, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to travel and to experience that. And to, because it makes me ask questions about my assumptions about the ways in which my faith is expressed. Um, I'm just not at the moment thinking of another um, minority situation that, well, I mean, the other situation I would say is right here at home is indigenous Christians within the indigenous community. Our indigenous Christians face discrimination on both sides. They face discrimination within our churches, but they also face it from indigenous people who cannot imagine why they remain Christian in light of residential schools and what, what has been done to their ancestors and their families. And so I look at the witness of faithfulness. Um, in our church, the uh, indigenous, we, we have a emerging self-determining indigenous church that uh, in its documents that it is currently um, developing for that, uh, those documents are completely written around the gospel. There's gospel centered in a way that our in my, in my church, our canons and constitution look very much like British parliamentary process, uh, parliamentary <laughs> structures. And, and the indigenous uh, description, um, you know, starts with creation and the creator and who they are in relationship to the creator. And then from that spreads out how they want to live in relationship to creation and the creator. And so, uh, and they are a minority within the larger indigenous population, and it's a costly place to be. Um, at, at one and the same time, they are looked to for pastoral care, for, uh, for support by the wider community, and at the same time, they're vilified for staying in the church. Uh, so if we want to look at a minority that's really living in the midst of difference, um, I would say look close to home. I think sometimes too, and, and you've alluded to it, is is that it's not simply a, a minority situation. It's also place where you find yourself in in a society. And I'm old enough to have been influenced quite significantly in theological education by liberation theology coming out of Latin America, particularly, uh, but also other forms of liberation theology that emerged in the 70s and 80s, and and again how the gospel is read uh, from a different social or economic place is, is always very interesting. And the critique that comes uh, when, when the, the gospel is told from, from a, a place that isn't a place of power. Um, and, and I think those, uh, as the church grew in the global south, and particularly, I say, Latin America, but elsewhere as well, um, we were hearing the gospel in a different way. We, we, we had to hear the gospel in a different way. And I think that's impacted us. And, and I think we still need to listen uh, wherever the gospel is told from the margins or from a place that isn't of power. Uh, it sounds very different and it calls us to a different life and a different way of being uh, than when when the gospel is told from a place of power. Well, we've had a few people ask questions that boil down to one question, which is when we take into account the challenges facing local congregations, why should the church get so involved in issues in other parts of the world and not leave them in God's hands? Because of the great commandment. <laughs> uh, love God and love your neighbor. I mean, I, I... Yeah, 
God's hands are our hands. And if we have heard the cry of our neighbor, uh, we need to respond in some way. Now, we can't fix everything. And obviously you have to discern what are the things you can respond to. And, and of course our church is facing challenges, but if we simply turn in on ourselves and say, it's all about um, saving us and it's all about rescuing our church, I, I, I think that's an abandonment of our discipleship because God has called us even to serve unto death. So even if our churches are dying, and that may be a possibility, even if they are dying, I am convinced God will have a church in the world. And our task is to ensure that we keep witnessing to the light of the gospel, which is not for us, it is for the world. And that includes those who are near and those who are far. And I also know from my experience in both pastoral ministry and as a bishop, that there are people in our congregations who will be deeply engaged in what's happening in other parts of the world and some who will, who will be deeply engaged in what's happening on the neighboring street. And it's, it's a both and, not an either or. So I hope we never turn inwards completely because every time I've seen that happen, it's been a death mm. without much resurrection. <laughs> and I think that the resurrection comes when we have given ourselves away for the sake of Christ and something new emerges that we hadn't expected. And we won't know what that looks like. And so the call now is to be faithful to what we have heard. I'm just, I'm, I'm hearing in what you're saying, the, the words of Bonhoeffer again in the cost of discipleship. And so often quoting uh, Jesus, you know, saying that if, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross yes, and follow me. If you want to save your life, you'll lose it. And the first will be last and the last will be first. That's, that's the call of the gospel, the life to which we're called as followers of Jesus. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's hard. If you read the gospel stories, it was hard for the people who heard that. Just give me time to go and look after this before I follow you. Or let me, let me tidy something up and then, then I'll be ready to, to go. Or... You know, uh, what about my father in the fishing business over here? That it, it's um, it's it's a call that comes to us again and again and again as we read the stories of the gospel. Uh, and and for for Bonhoeffer again in in Germany in the 1930s, that that was a, a very costly discipleship cost him his life, cost many other German Christians their lives. Um, but it it was a call that that the the church, the institutional church, wasn't what was so important. It was, as you're saying, to be faithful and to follow in the way that Jesus calls us wherever that may lead. Uh, so I uh, I would you know strongly agree that we can't simply ignore that call because it is costly or because it, it it makes us change or think differently or or be the church in a different way uh that's exactly what the gospel is all about if if we don't follow that call then then who are we who are we i think at this point we have about one question worth of time left yes. so i will ask it um ralph and irene ask I wonder whether you think we as a church, as Christians, have moved not just from a place of power and respect, but actually to a place of being disparaged and disrespected in many quarters now. I, for one, am at times rather embarrassed to identify as Christian, given some of the ways Christians are now expressing themselves uh, 
and in ways that some uh, many are seen as unjust and bigoted privileged even not at all christ-like do we need to develop prophetic voice especially within the body of christ well certainly the christian community is diverse and there are uh certainly voices that i would not want to be identified with that are claiming the voice of christ i think this is it, it, you know we, we are a minority and yes um it takes a great humility and vulnerability to say yes i'm a follower of jesus christ and this is what it means to me knowing that um you may immediately be identified with people that you want to have nothing to do with because of their views uh, or because of the way they they approach the scriptures or the way they uh, take that um, into the public square. Uh, but I do think, um, because I think there's a stereotype today, uh, or well, I, I'm, I'm sort of thinking out loud here as you can, as you can hear. Um, I think that stereotype is changing a bit. I mean, one of the ways to check the stereotype is to see how it's being portrayed in movies and on television. Mm -hmm. And 20 years ago, it was kind of stereotypically uh, at the, the, the kind of conservative right end, if you want. Or it was so nondescript that you couldn't tell what they believed at all. It just had a kind of, it was kind of a bland, this is what society looks like. In the last 10 or 15 years, I've seen far more representations of people of faith that are actually real and honest and, um, and discerning. And they're not many of them, but, uh, and I'm, I'm having trouble sort of naming a movie, but, but I do know that when I've seen them, I've gone, oh, that, that at least is something I can identify with. And it's, it's a, it's a presentation of what it is to live the Christian life that is not either all prosperity gospel or um, all uh, so bland that there's no teeth in it. There's nothing to, to, to grab onto. Um, obviously, we are living with the stereotypes that have come from the long history of residential schools and sexual abuse that because that's what people see in the news. I mean, we hit the news when one of our clergy or one of our people uh, violates boundaries and, and does something that, that uh, is unacceptable. And of course, that's the stereotype that many people have. And it's, it is hard to say, yes, I am a, an Anglican and I, I belong to the church that that person was part of. And I can promise you that that behavior is not acceptable and that we are uh, constantly working at being a safer, safer church, um, but it does take a certain amount of humility to, to to continue to identify as Christian when when there is disparagement and denigration of the faith. Sometimes, in in my experience. Um, and and what the world sometimes is calling us to, I think, is integrity in who we are and between what we say and what we do. And, you know, no matter what people may call us or the image that they may bring, if you if you live your life with integrity and a life of service and of compassion and of justice, um, that's all we can do. That's mm -hmm. that's who we're called to be. And uh, um, I think that can some, sometimes soften or change or uh, put a different window on what it means to be a follower of Jesus uh, in the world, whether you're an Anglican or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or a United Church or whoever you might be, uh, that to, to be a follower is reflected in, in how we live our lives. Um, and 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 that's that's who we are. That's who we're called to be. I'm often struck by the fact that at the end of the day, the only thing we have to offer is our integrity of living the faith, and that will have to speak for itself. And mm -hmm. 
we have to trust that it will be enough by the grace of God uh, for God's purposes. Yes. I think that's where we'll draw to a close tonight. And uh, just thank you, Linda, for being with us tonight and uh, and in the conversations as well. And the the four of us, the uh, and three that I kind of invited in the first place to become part of this. Thank you so much. I, I think they they've been rich conversations. I hope the people who have joined us have also found them to be rich conversations and. Uh, Hopefully, it's a sign of, of our unity in our discipleship as well uh, for a broader, a broader Canada and a broader world. Thank you very much, Bob. It's been a privilege to participate with you. And I thank you for taking the leadership and calling us together for this. So let's just have a moment of silence and I'll say amen. And then, Jim, you can uh, sign us off with what you need to do tonight. Thank you. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone. Very much appreciate your attending tonight. And um, thank you for joining um, the, uh, the entire Ecumenical Advent series this year. And to see all the meditations and conversations that we've had in this series, you can visit advent2022.ca. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs>